All right, well, uh, we have been on the road and traveling for 20 days now, and we thought we would do a video uh, kind of summarizing what we learned about getting a wilderness permit and what that process is like, and maybe just answer a few uh, questions or doubts that you might have like we had uh, before we had done it. So in quick summary, uh, we got three permits in Yosemite. We got one to start at Rafferty Creek into Lemony Meadows, backpack down and into the, into the valley and do Half Dome. And then we got one to go up Yosemite Falls and uh, sleep in the North Dome El Cap side of things and then come back out. And then the third was to go into Tuolumne Meadows from the Glen Allen area and sleep at Young Lakes. So those are the three permits we got. Those are the three that we did. Um, and then we came to Zion National Park and we got a permit to do the Narrows hike from the top down, which was like 20 miles and you have to pick a campsite and all of those sorts of things. So that's kind of our experience with backcountry wilderness permits. Um, I also have a little bit of experience. I did a backcountry wilderness uh, hike in Alaska, Denali National Park, and then I went down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and back up. So we have a little bit in there. So um, yeah, you, if anything you wanna start with or add before I continue? Well, so some are easier to get than others. Like some you can walk in that day and you can get one for the next day. And then there's lotteries for certain ones and then there's just in advance ones. So, yeah, so maybe, maybe we'll explain a little bit about how we got ours. So the first one that we got was the Half Dome one or to Wallaby Meadows to the Valley, which then you could add Half Dome for free. Uh, you don't, so you don't, you don't need a lottery to do Half Dome if you're tacking it onto a wilderness permit. And um, the way the wilderness permits work in Yosemite, um, in my opinion, it was a little bit confusing where they basically, you basically pick a trailhead and then from that trailhead, you have to go in a certain direction. So it, you don't have to necessarily define where you're gonna sleep each and every night. Um, and the, the, back, the rangers weren't like real stringent on telling us, you know, where are you gonna be this night and next night? They basically didn't care. Um, but you have to kind of go in a certain direction. So you can't, you can't go like three quarters of a mile in on this trailhead and then turn around and go across the street and go in some other direction. That would be against the rules. Um, and they release a portion of those permits like six months in advance and then a portion of those permits, uh, what is it, two weeks in advance? Yeah, and it's different for different areas, different parks. So. Yeah. So the first thing that we would suggest doing is um, let's, let's pretend that um, you want a permit for September 21st. So then you would need to log in and try and get it on September 7th. Well, instead of doing that, uh, imagine that you actually want to go in on the 14th. And then on September 1st, right at 10 a.m., go through the process on the computer or on the app and, and see what that process looks like and see how fast the permits go. Um, and and it's, kind of, it's like a dry run. And if you end up getting a permit, just close the browser and then it will re-release it for someone else to grab. So you can just you can just sort of get a taste and feel of what that process looks like. And, and Michelle basically figured out that like, if you're too deep into the backcountry permit process, when it hits 10 a.m., it won't refresh. And so you have to you have to be at the screen where the first button you hit is like explore backcountry permits. If you're if you've already clicked that button, then it just keeps showing that they're not available even though it's 1001, 1002, 1003. So dry running that process with two people, two phones, two accounts, that it kind of gives you like a sense of what it's going to be like uh, at the exact moment when you try and get your permit cuz depending on which one you're going, I mean they go within like 5 seconds of 10 a.m. And uh, we use time.gov, the website, to really be like spot on. And, and it was spot on, like, yeah. you know, 10 o'clock and one second we hit explore, group size two, trailhead, boom. And, and, and under those conditions, which sounds stringent, like it wasn't that hard to get what we wanted. We also were looking for the middle of the week, not the weekend. And I also played around with the different trailheads to see which ones went like immediately. And we went for one that was less, seemed a little bit less popular. Rafferty Creek in this case. Yeah. Yeah. So then, uh, so then you get your permit and then basically nothing happens for a couple weeks. Um, and uh, you do have to describe what you're gonna do when you get the permit. 
uh, when you're buying the permit on rec.gov, you have to describe like you want to spend the first night here and and then they might ask you to just, they ask you to give like a brief itinerary. And um, I made the mistake on permit number three of getting my lakes mixed up. And I said like, we're gonna spend this night at Glen Allen and this night at Young Lakes. And, and they actually like froze my permit and said like, basically you can't do that unless you cross the country off trail. Is that really what you meant? And so I went in and edited it and, and then they gave it to us, it was no problem. But they do read that, uh, even though it's kind of a manual visual thing that somebody's reading. Um, and they will help you as well in the permit office. Yeah. The rangers can help you, you know, if you make more of a plan if you need to, but you did have to pick that first night. That was the, the one that they expected you to know. Yep. And each trailhead has like different specific constraints. So like if you're coming in from the valley, it says you have to stay at Little Yosemite Valley uh, Campground. If you're coming from Tuolumne Meadows, it says like you have to get past, you know, I think four miles of trailhead uh, distance and one mile of air uh, distance to the road, things like that. So just read that specifically. Um, yeah, so then we got to Yosemite and they will not let you pick up your permit uh, more than a day in advance. So if you're going in on a Monday, you can pick it up on a Sunday or on a Monday. And that really annoyed me. Um, like, it just feels kind of archaic. And, um, you know, it's, it's like you're going to pick up this stupid piece of paper. And anyway, um, but after doing it a few times, I kind of began to realize perhaps why they're doing it. Um, they want a face-to-face -face interaction. They want to make sure you understand some of the rules and regulations. They also wanna have that conversation with you close to departure time so that they can talk to you about the weather or bear activity or other mm -hmm. things that may be present today that weren't present a week ago. So I kind of grew in my understanding of that, although I still didn't like it, uh, because like for the Narrows, we kind of had to make this extra trip all the way over the, over, over the visitor center from the east side just to pick up the permit and, um, yeah, and the permit has additional um, information on it. It has like the size of your group, the entry date, um, and some specific requirements that you have to sign and the ranger signs. And then that's kind of like a binding contract that you have to keep, they ask you to keep with you. Um, yeah, and um, so then like, so one thing that we didn't know when we were just back home in Chattanooga looking at our computers is like, how strict are they about the entrance date and the exit date? Um, and uh, the simple answer is that basically nothing in the backcountry process was enforced at all. We never saw a ranger who asked for our permit, except for when we came down off of Half Dome. At the bottom of Half Dome, uh, in an area at the bottom called Sub Dome, there was a ranger checking permits, but that's like a specialty attraction. There was, we never saw rangers, you know, when we went in, we never saw rangers while we were out there, we never saw rangers when we came back. And, and so basically, even though this process exists, our experience was that it was completely unenforced, which means a couple things. Um, first of all, you could do the whole thing without a permit and, and probably have no consequences, although I'm not saying that's right. Um, second thing is, like you could deviate from your permit and probably no one would ever know. The other thing that they're not real upfront about, but is obvious, and they did admit, is like, you may find yourself you know exhausted and hypothermic or heat exhaustion and you may not have gotten as far as you thought you did or you may be faster than you thought you were and so like most of the stuff is really not binding uh, people get lost they end up on the wrong trailhead um, and, and so like basically what you began to realize is like they don't care when you come out of there like you have basically the permit is it starts so let's say September 1st and it goes for 14 days uh, they don't care if you come out 12 days or eight days or four days. Like they're not paying attention. They're not tracking that. You don't have to let them know when you're out. So it's what appears to be maybe like this really strict, rigid machine uh, in real life in terms of enforcement ends up being super, you know, kind of loosey goosey. Yeah, I'll say like the first ranger that we talked to, he also said that like you don't know what it's going to be like out there. You don't like the elevation was different for us. So we thought we would hike faster than we did. And, um, or, you know, you don't feel well, you have to like take longer breaks and you get into a different camp than you thought. So they were very understanding of that. Like he was, yeah, he was the first one. Yeah. Just that like, you don't know what's going to happen out there. 
please follow these rules to the best of your ability, but we understand if like you get stuck and you have to camp somewhere that you didn't plan on. Yeah. Right. Um Yeah, so the next thing is um the information require like the information that you want to have and know for a backcountry experience, I would say is a little bit obscure. So the easiest example to note is um, camping near Half Dome. Um, and I talked about this on the day that we did Half Dome in that video, but basically um, the permit that we were holding in our hands when we were in the backcountry ready to do Half Dome said that there's no camping on top of Half Dome and there's no camping between this specific junction and the valley. And so that made it crystal clear to anyone who reads English that you can camp along the Half Dome Trail which is like a two mile section between the top of Half Dome and this junction, the junction of the John Muir Trail and, and uh, Sunrise Creek or something like that. So, um, and yet we were so surprised that the contract seemed to indicate that you could camp there because we thought that would be protected and, and you know, no, no camping here. And um, we even talked to some other backpackers who said like, oh yeah, you're not allowed to camp up there. You'll get in big trouble. And, and, and then we studied it and it's, everything on the contract is written you know kind of by a lawyer like it's very precise it's not sloppy um, the way that they document uh, camping in the high sierra camps is like crystal clear so um, yeah we decided to camp um, on the half dome trail and we were way off trail we followed the procedures about you know uh, we were like 300 feet off trail out of sight not near water i mean a durable surface um, but we kind of felt like, boy, it almost feels like this isn't allowed. So hiking, uh, getting closer to the valley, we ran into uh, not a ranger, but someone who's working on like the bathrooms and uh, kind of like, a, I think I asked him, I said, hey, are you a ranger? And he said, yeah, basically, but not officially. And I said, oh, okay, I, can I ask you a question? Are you allowed to camp on the Half Dome Trail? And he's like, no, absolutely not. And, and um, I was like, oh, really? Like, um, why not? And he's like, well, let me see your permit. And we read it together. And he's like, well, that's why. And I was like, well, that reads that it's allowed. He's like, oh no, it's just worded funny. It's not allowed. I worked in the permit office for years. We told everyone you can't camp there. I was like, okay, weird. So then when we went to pick up our second permit to do Yosemite Falls, I went in and I asked the ranger, I just said, hey, just a question about camping on the Half Dome Trail. And um, I showed her the verbiage on the contract and she acknowledged that it seemed to indicate that camping there was fine. Then she took me over to the National Geographic illustrated map that they use for planning. And there's like this purple area, which is shaded uh, along the different trails where there's no camping. And where we wanted to camp, where we did camp, was not in the purple shaded zone. And so she kind of was like, well, I guess if you want to, you could. But she was like real nonchalant about it, as if like she'd never been asked that question, which we found surprising. And and, and we kind of realized that, um, like so many other things in life, there's the rule, which is like precise, and then there's the application or the enforcement of the rule that kind of gets gray. And um, I think, I'm not certain about this, but I think rangers um, sort, of, um, sort of overextend a little bit what like kind of the letter of the law says, because it makes their life easier, uh, which I kind of get. Um, and I'm not really blaming them for, it's just kind of our observation. Um, but anyway, it, it, it's like you talk to three rangers, you get three answers, and then the literature says something else entirely. And, and so that, that's, I don't know, that was frustrating because- Because we, we were really trying to do the right thing. Yeah. And we also knew that climbing up Half Dome was like a big physical thing. And so we wanted to be as close as we could because it right. was gonna be a long day. We also had like the rest of that day to like get down to the valley, which was yeah something like that yeah yeah and um so so then maybe one or last one or two last things to say so we interacted with like seven rangers in total in yosemite in zion getting permits asking questions um and and i would say that basically um six of the seven were pretty grumpy and unfriendly and unhelpful the very first guy we met was super nice um and he told us all the rules you know i mean he wasn't like um like lazy about it but he, but he actually said at the end he's like and don't forget to have fun you know I feel like we're always just telling people what to do and not to do like don't forget it's beautiful and have fun 
but the other six like were really uh it was pretty unpleasant experiences and uh we we never had done anything wrong but um just the way we were treated um you know it, it just felt like uh pretty unpleasant and and at first we were trying to figure out like what is this is it just one or two grumpy rangers but we kind of ended up realizing in the end i think that um rangers are not that fond of backpackers um i think that they recognize that backpackers are going out into a place where they're not going to be supervised and no one's really going to keep you know t uh, track of them and then whatever they do out there it's going to be kind of anonymous like if they make a mess or you know they don't bury their poop or whatever and and so they kind of almost we, we ended up realizing like we were kind of being treated as like a liability like oh man like I might have to come and rescue you because you didn't bring enough water, you know? And so they just see you as like a risk. And, um, and I mean, that's just our impression. We may be wrong, but we also realized that, you know, a lot of rangers probably uh, started out in life loving nature, loving the outdoors. And then because, you know, of all these permits and regulations and, and people doing things they're not supposed to do, they kind of turn into like wilderness cops, you know? Like they're not teaching people about the flora and the fauna they're they're like let me check your permit or you're not supposed to be up here here's a ticket and um and so we we have a certain amount of sympathy for um you know their attitude and their frustration you know if, if we're right in that assumption which we might not be um so that was kind of sad to see because um i would not seen that before and and you know maybe covid and certain circumstances made it worse but uh, we talked to other people along the way who told us stories of you know search and rescues where rangers were out all night long looking for someone who you know forgot to check back in and let them know that they're really safe and so i can understand that rangers see people as like oh great i'm gonna be searching all over the backcountry for your butt even though you're at a hotel somewhere and you didn't let us know you know your family's calling and you know freaked out or something so um yeah and then maybe like one other thing is like so um, the backpackers campgrounds uh, in Yosemite basically the rule is that um, like if you're going in on September 2nd then you can spend September 1st that night at the backpackers campground the day before and then if you come out on the 10th you can spend that first night at the backpackers campground so two nights per backpacking experience and um, the campgrounds weren't that great so basically um, what did it cost to stay there eight dollars each yeah, so it was eight dollars each per night, and basically you had like you had to park in Curry Village and and basically walk almost a mile to get to it. Um, they only had vault toilets, you know, no flushable toilets, no sinks, no electricity, no showers. And then in contrast, Camp Four was only uh, four dollars more per person, mm -hmm. and they have you know sinks and showers and all kinds of things. So. It's, it's kind of like, oh, they're letting me stay at this campground since I bought a backpacker's permit, but then I'm actually paying almost the price of Camp 4 and not getting the amenities of being able to park close and, and all of that. And so it's kind of just like, oh, they're not really treating backpackers that well, are they? And, and then there was like outdated information. We were going to stay at White Wolf Backpackers Campground. And um, when we mentioned that to the ranger when we were getting our permit, they're like, oh, no, that's closed. You can't stay there. It's like, oh, really? Oh, we didn't know it was closed. Well, White Wolf Campground's closed, so of course the Backpackers Campground's closed. It's like, oh, we didn't know that. And so all of a sudden we're in this bind where we wanted to stay up in the meadow and, you know, we kind of couldn't the night before. And, like, there's just not a lot of empathy for that kind of stuff. And, um, anyway, maybe last comment, unless you'd like to add something. But, like, when you're in the national parks, you, you kind of try to... Okay, I'll give you an example. Like, when you're in the petrified forest, it says the removal or collection of petrified uh, wood is strictly prohibited and punishable by law. Okay, so it's like this super strict, don't do this. Then in other places, in the same park, and in other parks, it says like, you know, collecting of firewood, prohibited. And then in other places, it says, you know, no camping. And in other places, it says, please keep off the grass. And in the bathrooms, it says, you know, please keep six distance and keep your mask on, even though COVID's over. And in other places, it says, please wash your hands. So you have like all of these, you have like this spectrum of desires from the National Park Service of like do's and don'ts. But but then within, within this list of do this and don't do this, there's like this variance in like severity. Like they really don't want you to take petrified wood, but then like 
and says, you know, please keep off the grass. It's like, well, do I have to keep off the grass? Like, I really would like to go sit on that grass, you know? Or they say, like, please camp on durable surfaces. It's like, well, do I have to? Is it strictly prohibited? You know, like, if I really want that site over there because it's lush and beautiful in the view. And, and so, as someone who is trying to follow the rules, it's, it's, it's almost like you, it's almost like, well, like, how much do you really mean this? Um, you know, and uh, I don't know, it, it just, it's a little bit vexing and it also feels like you can't talk to rangers about it because they just treat you like you're going to go ruin the backcountry. You know, you're going to feed the bears and you're going to step on the lichen and you're going to leave poop all over and, and like you're just creating problems. And, um, and that's just kind of frustrating to me because, you know, in the end, the National Park Service has, you know, built buildings and laid roads and done all kinds of things that have disturbed nature, you know, and um, people are driving these massive RVs through the valley, polluting the air and, um, you know, but then, then the rangers talk to backpackers like, you know, stay on the trail. If you take one step off the trail, you might crush a gecko's house. <laughs> and it's just like, I don't know, it just feels a bit over the top to me, it feels a little bit out of proportion, and it kind of felt to me that like the National Park Service doesn't like backpackers. Like that was that was kind of what we said. It was like, you know, they really don't like us backpackers. So That's what it felt like. And then I'll say like out on the trail though, like especially like way back in the backcountry, like I don't think I ever saw a piece of trash. I mean like there was not evidence, I mean, besides there is a well-worn trail in Yosemite that, like, people were out there. So, it seems to me that, like, and, and I, we could be totally missing something, like, maybe backpackers in the past have been, like, a big problem and a big mess. I don't know, but it seems like um, the people that go out there are doing a good job of, like, taking care of their stuff and not leaving trash and, um... The backpackers we met along the way were very pleasant, and yeah. I know we felt like they were just excited to be out there and have the challenge. And um, so overall, it was a really pleasant experience. Once you got out there, it was confusing up front, and I mean, we debated on the half, like at Half Dome, like for a long time, what what should we do? So we finally like made our decision about where to camp after we like read the permit over and over and over. <laughs> so yeah, we basically got to the point where we said, we're if we are breaking the rules, we're doing it with a clear conscience. And like we're, we slept that night with a clear conscience. Yeah. Um, and we didn't poke the bear. Like we didn't go up to the ranger afterwards and you know say like, hey, we slept right over there. Is that okay? Like he was super rude and grumpy, and it was just like we're not, you know, we're not gonna poke the bear, and we're not gonna go around publicizing like, hey, you camp here. But at the same time. And then, and then last comment, the, the irony is that like we also rock climb and rock climbing is like completely unregulated, completely. Like, you know, we were climbing a pitch at, you know, 10 o'clock at night and like, you know, there's, there doesn't have to be anything on the car. Why are cars parked there? We didn't have to register that we were climbing. We didn't have to show that we have the right equipment. And like we were scampering all over vegetation up on a cliff, you know, and and people are you know we didn't but like people are drilling holes in the rock to install bolts and people are wrapping slings around trees and bushes and and i mean it's like it's just so seemingly inconsistent that like to go for a hike you know and a trail like you have to do all this paperwork sign all this stuff but then like to go climb up you know half like to go climb a big wall assuming you don't stay overnight like nothing's needed at all I, it's just it's really str i thought that was really strange so anyway we're not trying to uh, beat up the national park service we're not trying to beat up rangers um we're just trying to um give an honest viewpoint of what it was like for us so right. hopefully that helps you figure it out and um yeah have a have a good time out there because it was amazing i mean it's so oh, yeah. cool to be like miles from any car <laughs> or electricity or building and just like all of it on your with your with your two legs yeah it was like so much fun yeah 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 so anyway hope this was a bit of a ramble but hopefully <laughs> um it was helpful and um if you didn't like it give it a thumbs down let me know and if you did like it um i'm glad hope it helps you take care have fun out there and enjoy the world that god has made
What do you think it was? 18 minutes? 20. 25.